nature designs for life. Regeneration is built into nature's operating system. This is the web of life. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to describe to you one of the great miracles of nature. So in my hand rests a solitary broccoli seed, brown and oval shaped with a conspicuous white spot on one flank. Now it appears almost microscopic in the middle of my palm, like no more than like a millimeter in diameter. Given the right conditions, however, this wee seed could grow into a seven inch wide broccoli head comprised of distinct florets. But I've got other plans for it. You see, I've become an avid sprouter. <laughs> now one can sprout seeds of myriad species, including but not limited to alfalfa, clover, fenugreek, uh, turnip green, wheatgrass, wild rice, green pea, radish, azuki bean, lentil, chickpea, mung bean, red cabbage. Um, I've tried many of them. Now, the requirements from an equipment perspective for sprouting are quite negligible. A wide mouth, quart sized mason jar, uh, some cheese cloth, and a rubber band. Now, sure, you can purchase kits that incorporate metal holsters that secure the mason jars at a 45 degree angle to facilitate proper drainage, uh, but it's hardly necessary. You can stack your sprouting jars beautifully on a dish drying rack, among other improvisations. Now, two tablespoons of these minuscule broccoli seeds will yield a pound of sprouts in four to six days. And the labor is hardly onerous. You soak the seeds for six to eight hours, put the jars in a cool and shady spot, and then simply rinse and drain them twice per day. Now, it is immensely gratifying to watch the seeds push forth their tiny little white stem and green dollhouse-sized leaves. Now, this process of germination is pre-photosynthetic. The seedling is leveraging warehoused energy, a small parcel of food stored in the endosperm of the seed. And the stockpiled nutrients, starch, fats, and proteins can lay dormant within this seed for literally thousands of years. But given the right conditions, moisture, air, and a moderate temperature, the embryo will be activated to grow cracking through the dampened seed coat and sprout. Now the seed plant cycle is one of miraculous self-perpetuation. Now if I hadn't planned on layering these broccoli sprouts lavishly on my hummus top seed crackers, I could plant them and these sprouts would grow roots and become a seedling and with proper nurture mature into a plant. Now, as boys become adolescents, they often become intensely malodorous. Plants, on the other hand, adopt a patently different olfactory attraction strategy. As many plants mature, they develop flowers, petals of every imaginable hue whose oils perfume the air. Now, both the fragrance and flamboyance of flower petals are designed to attract pollinators, bees, wasps, hummingbirds, bats, beetles, flies, moths, who are lured in for the nectar. Not unlike how the golden arches bait our teenagers for french fries. Now, the job of our winged friends is to move pollen grains formed on a flower's anther to the flower's stigma. Okay, so let's quickly detour into a brief primer on the structure of plants. A flowering plant has ample reason to identify as non-binary as it boasts both male and female reproductive parts. 
Now, the male sexual organ of a plant is referred to as the stamen, while the female sexual organ is known as the pistil, containing the stigma, style, and ovary. Now, the stamen produces pollen grains, and the seeds of the plant develop in the pistil. Now, typically, the pollen grains are transported to the pistils with the help of insects and birds that visit flowers to pilfer their sweet juices. Now, pollen grains are uncommonly sticky, and this is adaptive because as insects loot the flower for its nectar, pollen adheres to their bodies. The stigmas of flowers are also quite tacky and snatch the pollen grains off the flagellating insects. Pollination is the movement of pollen grains formed on the flower's anther to the flower's stigma, and pollinators are the delivery service. The male reproductive cells, gametes, are carried in the pollen grain. So the grain travels through the ovary tube of the plant where it meets the female gametes in the ovules. And voila, fertilization. <laughs> it's not exactly dinner in a movie, but there is a certain sort of understated romance to it all. Now, when the pollen fertilizes an ovule, it transforms into a seed that contains an embryo in the form of a root and a shoot and some stored food for the aforementioned future germination. Then the ovary wall develops into a pod or a fruit for the singular purpose of safeguarding the seed. It's all about the seed. So seeds are dispersed by wind and gravity and water. In some plants, seeds are housed within a fruit such as apples and oranges. These fruits, including the seeds, are eaten by animals who then disperse the seeds when they defecate, unwittingly planting them in fertilizer. The fruit exists to safeguard the seed, insulating the potentiality of life. Seed, germination, sprouting, seedling, maturing, pollination, fertilization, fruiting, seed. And around and around it goes. Seeds beget seeds within an intricate web of mutuality and interdependence that evolved over millions and millions of years. See, nature designs for life. Regeneration is built into nature's operating system. This is the web of life. The bee mutually arises with the flower. Their tryst produces the fruits upon which we delight and in our metabolism of them generate the carbon dioxide that is subsequently extracted from the atmosphere by the plant's plastids for the production of energy, much of which is recycled back into the fruit. You see, there is no boss in nature's equation. Nature is a pure, true democracy. Everyone plays a part. There is reciprocity and mutuality baked into it. Now, sure, there are trophic hierarchies, tops of the food chain, but ecosystems can be equally upended from the top or the bottom. You extirpate the wolves and a top-down trophic cascade results, leaving the grasslands fallow. You kill all the microbes in the soil with herbicides and a bottom-up cascade ensues. Plant life becomes frail, stripped of nutrients, and unable to provide proper sustenance to those like us up the food chain. Evolution produces this sensitive order. It's neither stable or perfect or even fair, but it goes on learning through the eyes of trillions of its modifications. This force, this aggregate intelligence is the great oneness of the universe. It's the Brahman. And each one of us is its delegated adaptability.